Hey everybody, my name is Wayne Baker. Welcome back. Thanks for spending this time with me. Today, we're gonna to start a new series on why we commit infidelity with betrayal. And at least once a week, I hear a betrayed spouse in my office say these words, and probably many of you have said it too, is how could you? And then that is quickly followed by this long list of questions how could you do this to our family? How could you do this to our children? How could you jeopardize everything we've built together and worked for? How could you put all that at risk? How could you put your family at risk? How could you do this to not only me, but to yourself? And every week, almost daily, I see the tears and the hurt and the pain and the shame and the guilt. I see it every day. I see normal, decent human beings Many, many of which seem to have it all. They've got great jobs, beautiful kids, great friends, and, and many times the couple have a, a great friendship. Yet one of them has done something that neither of them could have ever imagined would happen. So, so then that question of why comes up time and time again. Did he lack character? Was there something amiss in her moral development? Perhaps there was some sort of deep, unexplored childhood wound or trauma at the core of his or her betrayal. And, and even then, I'm sure countless, countless others have suffered similar wounds, and they've not betrayed their spouse with infidelity. So there's this question that I'd like to begin to unpack over the next couple of weeks. It's not just how does someone commit betrayal of infidelity, but more specifically, how do they betray their own sense of morals and values? Uh, how do they betray themselves? How do we betray ourselves? I believe for a long time now that the unfaithful spouse betrays themselves first before they betray the other person. So how are we able to suspend what at one point in time was a core value that we held so deeply that, uh, that has allowed us then to have an affair or engage in a behavior that once upon a time we were repulsed by. So in the early 1960s, there was a psychologist named Stanley Milligram. And if you ever took a psychology class in college, you might be familiar with this because we all had to read about it. But Stanley Milligram wanted to investigate the personality profile of those individuals in Nazi Germany who had marched millions of Jews and Poles and homosexuals and other misfits of their society into the gas chambers. Social, social psychologists estimated that slightly more than 1% of the population would fit that profile. It's important to remember they estimated 1%. And to identify these individuals, an experiment was conducted where subjects were told they were part of an experiment uh, studying the effectiveness of negative reinforcement. Their role was to administer an electrical shock to a student in adjacent room. Uh, they couldn't see that student. And each time the student failed to supply the correct answer to a problem, the subject would flip a switch and the student in the next room would get a shock. Now, the truth is there wasn't a student in the adjacent room. There was just a recording of someone sounding like they had gotten shocked. Well, to begin with, the, the subjects were given a 45 volt shock as an example of what the first shock felt like. The same one that would, that would give the student upon missing the problem. That's what they were told. They were also told that the student had a heart problem, but this experiment wasn't gonna cause any damage or, or, or danger the student. With each missed problem, the subject would raise the voltage and flip the switch. Now remember, the student was not actually being shocked. There wasn't even a student in there, there was a recording. And many subjects, the people flipping the switch, would pause at about 135 volts and question again the purpose of this experiment. Eventually, the voltage levels exceeded 315 volts, and the subjects would hear nothing as he or she would continue to raise the voltage, cruelly flipping the switch when they heard no answer at all. That's what they were prompted to do. 
And if at any time the subject tried to stop the experiment, the scientist in the lab uh, would inform that, that the, the experiment had to continue and they were required. They signed the paperwork. They were required to continue. And this was done up to four times. On the fifth time, if the subject requested to stop the experiment, the scientists would finally stop and excuse them. Otherwise, the experiment kept on going to the maximum voltage of 450 volts. So you see, Milligram and other social psychologists believed um, that he would have to go through several hundred subjects to find just a few individuals who would rather administer the maximum amount of voltage. But as it turned out, 65% of the subjects would inflict the maximum level of shock and pain. That's 65%. Remember, they projected 1%. Milligram had not found just a few sociopaths who would give their souls to a totalitarian and brutal cause. Rather, he found the potential for that in most of us. Why would a normal American citizen act in the same way as Nazi guards who participated in putting millions to death? Why do we place such a premium on approval of others, even when they're strangers? I see this in my, in my office every day. Some of you may be asking, why, what in the world does this have to do with infidelity? If, if the majority of the normal people in Milligram's experiment were able to suspend their own sense of humanity to the point where they believed they may have killed someone when they were still administering a shock and there was nothing coming back from the other side, is it too far-fetched to see how individuals might also commit betrayal they never ever thought was possible? There's an Edmund Burke cliche that says, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. I think that also needs a companion phrase where Albert Bandura said that the triumph of evil requires a lot of good people doing just a little bit of evil in a morally disengaged way with indifference to human suffering. So over the next few weeks, we're gonna explore this process of moral disengagement and how individuals can abandon what they believed, what they held dear, and they betray themselves and their loved ones and allow themselves to act in ways they never thought imaginable. We'll also look at a few ways to stay true to what it is you believe and help you gain some clarity about that as well. If you're in crisis and wanna accelerate your healing, consider joining us at an EMS weekend and begin 2020 with a tangible hope and clarity. I tell couples that that three days can possibly propel you to three or four months down the road in this journey. These three full days address your struggles with uh, the help of the whole team here at Affair Recovery, most of which we've all been through infidelity personally. It'll absolutely bring about restoration to your heart. I totally believe that and possibly to your marriage. So thanks for joining me today and I look forward to being with you again next week. Thanks so much.